Well, good morning, everyone. It's Eileen Bird. I'm the executive director here at Two Life. And I would like to welcome uh, people who are joining and we still have a few people that are coming on to our Zoom. Uh, I appreciate that everyone has signed on for today's program, uh, which is on the topic of immunotherapy and in particular breast cancer immunotherapy. And we're going to explore that topic uh, and you'll hear um, a whole lot more great, great information uh, with our, our guest, Dr. Margaret Gaddy Mays. And so I want to be sure that uh, I just share a few things as we get going here and that we uh, start to you know, just kind of set the scene. As you were uh, coming on to today's program, you are being joined in a, uh, in a mute and, uh, and, we, and we will not see you. Uh, you're going to see our panelists and you will see the, uh, the screen share with Dr. Getty Mays as she comes on and she has already joined us and is kind of in the background until we actually get things going here. And so what I want to invite is that today is really a combination of information sharing and then addressing questions. Uh, you may have a lot of questions about immunotherapy. I know I have learned a great deal about the topic and uh, there's a whole lot more on the horizon in terms of development, which makes today's, um, today's talk, I think a very good opportunity to kind of uh, uh, clear the air and make sure that we have a, a better foundation of understanding so that when these developments come out, we'll have a better handle on it. And so uh, I wanna invite you to put questions that you may have for Dr. into the chat which is located at the bottom of your screen. And now that we've all been doing Zoom for, uh, for a number of months, you're probably more familiar with navigating through that. Uh, I'm going to be moder um, you know, um, mo reviewing those, uh, those, those questions. And then I'll, we will have a Q&A following the formal presentation. And the formal presentation is probably gonna go for 40 or 45 minutes but you can put your questions into that chat at any time during there and then we'll get started. And so uh, what I'd like to do is, um, is I of course welcome you on behalf of Two Life and our upcoming and our, and our programming. Uh, today is our Beat the Odds program and to talk a little bit more about Beat the Odds is our Mara Ginsburg, who is our uh, founder of Two Life and President Emeritus. And so uh, Mara, I'm gonna turn it to you. Welcome. Thank you, Eileen. And thank you, Dr. Gotti Mays, for joining us today. This is our, uh, if I did the math right, 22nd Beat the Odds program uh, for Two Life. We used to do it at the racetrack. Uh, got a little noisy there, so we moved to other venues. And then, of course, last year and this year, we're doing it virtually. Uh, so to all of you who are new to uh, programs from Two Life or new to Beat the Odds, uh, thank you for joining us. I hope this uh, provides you with lots of information that you're looking for. And to all of you who are returning guests for Beat the Odds, welcome back. And I do wish I could see you in person, but I guess for a minute you can see me. So that's something. I don't know. We'll all be together soon, I hope. Um, today's program, as Eileen said, I'm the founder and uh, one of the principles of To Life is to provide uh, experts such as Dr. Gotti Mays so we can learn about what's going on and in this case, what new treatments are being researched and what's coming down the pike uh, to give us hope and inspiration and to hang on uh, for, uh, for a better future. A future without uh, breast cancer would be, of course, awesome. Um, so here we are, and uh, this this um, program is named in memory of our dear friend and supporter, Cynthia Shanker, who uh, loved to life, supported us financially, was on the board, and um, sadly passed away uh, just a few years ago. So we, we now do this lecture once a year in her memory. So Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Melanie McCulley, who uh, made this program happen. Uh, some of you who participate in support programs for Two Life know Melanie. She 
She's uh, very, very involved and she's our education director. So she put this program together and she's working feverishly on our upcoming program related to our Women's Health and Wellness Conference, which we used to do one day in November. And of course, because of COVID, we're doing it a little differently. But um, so stay tuned for future programs and I'm gonna turn it over to Melanie. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mara. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your interest in this important breast cancer topic. It's a true pleasure to welcome Dr. Margaret Gaddy Mays, who is this year's Memorial Cynthia Schenker speaker for Beat the Odds. Dr. Gaddy Mays is an assistant professor who joined the Division of Medical Oncology at The Ohio State University in August of 2020. She's a board certified internal in internal medicine and medical oncology with a primary focus in immuno, immuno-oncology and breast cancer. Her research is based in the clinic and focuses on tumor immunology and the development of novel immunotherapy approaches for breast cancer using therapeutic cancer vaccines, cytokines, antibodies, or immune modulators. So I would thank Dr. Gaddy Mays for being here today um, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. All right, um, so again, thank you so much um, to the Two Life program for inviting me here to speak today about breast cancer immunotherapy, um, one of my passions and in, in research and clinical interests. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about the past, present, and most excitingly, the future of immunotherapy and breast cancer. Okay, and so first I have no um, personal or professional conflicts of interest related to this, no financial disclosures. I will discuss some investigational non-FDA approved treatment during my presentation, and I'll be sure to identify those slides uh, when we come across them. So immunotherapy is something that many of you have probably encountered at some point, um, at least in the media. Um, and at least in um, uh, popular journals like Time, uh, maybe in scientific journals like Nature, we often see ads now for immunotherapy kind of gracing the pages of various magazines. And so I think, you know, kind of the first important question um, that we're going to talk about is really what it, does the immune system, cancer, and immunotherapy, how are they related? Um, and so I'll review some of the, the past information and what we know so far. Um, next, we'll talk about the success stories with immunotherapy and breast cancer. And luckily there have been quite a few um, in recent years. And then again, we'll talk about the future in terms of where do we go from here. So what exactly does the immune system have to do with cancer? Well, the immune system is the first line of defense against cancer. We've known this for many years now, um, and we see this specifically in patients who are immunocompromised, that they have higher risk, risks of developing cancer. And these are patients who have inherent immunocompromised states, like patients who have undergone solid organ or bone marrow transplants that are on immunosuppression, patients who have HIV, or patients who have innate or acquired immune deficiencies, meaning that there's something in their immune system that just doesn't quite work right. And we know that, so if we have, look at this picture here on the left side, we have the normal cells, which are the tan cells and the cancer cells, which are the red cells. And we know that the immune system is able to act almost like superheroes. And they're able to go through and they do this, the immune system does this many, many times during a normal day for any individual person that there's these abnormal cells, maybe cells that did not, when they um, multiply, did not quite multiply correctly, that there were mutations or errors. And the immune system is able to go through and get rid of them. When that happens, the, the abnormal cells are removed from the body and the normal cells are able to persist. And now the immune system does this usually through something called immunoediting. And so normally immune cells can proofread cells, much like our word processor or word can proofread the documents that we're typing. And so if you're typing quickly and you, know, you misalign um, some of the, uh, the letters, your word correct will put you know, a red line underneath it or sometimes autocorrect will change those words to what you intended. And this is similar to in the body of the process of immunoediting, which we refer to as elimination. 
So again, the, the immune system is able to get rid of these errors or these abnormal cells. However, some tumor cells are smart and they can distract these immune cells. They can put up various signals, various flares, basically distract them and fatigue some of these immune cells to the point that they're so tired, they're so distracted that they kind of let some of these abnormal cells slide. And what happens over time is a small error in, in typing can become a big error through, through propagation and multiplication of cells. And eventually this will potentially reach a state of equilibrium where these cells are able to persist. And eventually these cells become so numerous that they escape and the immune system is not able to um, adequately eliminate them and control them. And when that happens, that's when the immune system, or that's when these cancer cells are able to take hold and perhaps spread. Now, when we think of the, again, the role of the immune system with cancers, it's not only during the development of these cancers, but it's also during the persistence of these tumors. So some people in immunotherapy will often talk about cold tumors. And so, you know, just like everything else in life, there's good guys and bad guys. And that's the same thing with immune cells. We have our good immune cells, our good guys, which are our CD8 T cells and our natural killer cells or our NK cells. And there's many more good guys as well that I haven't listed here. But then we have bad guys as well, like regulatory T cells and macrophages, tumor associated macrophages. And these bad guys are the ones that sometimes keep the good guys out of the tumor, the environment around the tumor, the tumor microenvironment. Now, unfortunately, breast cancer is generally considered to be a cold tumor. And so these good guys can't really get into or around the tumor, but the bad guys can. And often when this happens, these cold tumors have a, generally a poorer prognosis and they generally have little response to immunotherapy. Now there's another type of tumor, which is called a hot tumor. These hot tumors are where they have lots of immune cells that are in and around the cancer. Hot tumors are things like melanoma or lung cancer, or bladder cancer. And in these hot tumors, the good guys are able to get into and around the tumor and they help keep the bad guys out. And this allows the good guys to be able to do their job where they can basically eradicate or eliminate these tumor cells. Now, the other thing about these hot tumors is they actually have now an improved prognosis because we're able to use immunotherapy to help further engage and activate the immune system. Now, if you look here between the cold tumor and the hot tumor, I've placed kind of a little medicine bottle. And I think that's one of the things that's going on right now in immunotherapy of saying, well, we've now established kind of which tumors are cold tumors and which are hot tumors, but can we potentially use medications like immunotherapy or combinations to convert the cold tumor into a hot tumor? Now, again, kind of when we think back to this tumor cell, you know, it can isolate itself. It puts out various lines of defense, various barriers. And as you can see here in the center, the tumor cell is enjoying itself. It's having a nice relaxing cup of coffee because it's put up all of these defenses to keep the immune cells out. It's almost like an onion. But immunotherapy can help peel back some of these layers. And so that's one of the parts of immunotherapy and specifically in breast cancer that's really exciting is we're starting to make headway in trying to transition some of these colder breast tumors to hot tumors. So in summary about the immune system, we know that it plays an important role in surveillance and in the elimination of abnormal cells through a process called immunoediting. We also know that tumor cells are able to insulate themselves with various mechanisms and this helps them hide from the immune system. And that it's these, through natural selection that these tumor cells that can avoid the immune system are the ones that can persist, grow, and ultimately spread. So I've mentioned immunotherapy multiple times, but what exactly is immunotherapy? So immunotherapy is a type of cancer treatment that helps your immune system fight cancer. And so it takes the immune cells that are there that are inherent in your body and helps to amplify or enhance their activity and helps to kind of make them almost super, super fighters or superheroes. Now, certain immunotherapies do this because they can mark these cancer cells so that it's easier for the immune system to find them and to destroy them. Again, other times they can help boost your immune system. Now there's various types of immunotherapy that we're gonna talk about in the next few minutes. 
What I'm going to start with is the most common category, which are T cell immune checkpoint modulators. So T cell, again, that's that CD8 cell, that's one of the good guys. And they're the cells that we want to get to the cancer. Now there are multiple approved agents, which are demonstrated in the names or the combination of letters, I guess some may say to the left of this picture here. We have Tecentric and Keytruda are the two that are approved in breast cancer, which is why they're bolded. The other names um, of the drugs are drugs that are approved in other types of tumors and are not yet approved for breast cancer. These, we're gonna specifically focus on the anti-PD-1, PD-L1 and anti-CTLA-4 antibodies because they're the ones that are, com that are, most, that are approved currently. However, there's multiple um, research trials right now that are going on looking at antibodies against TIM3, against VISTA, LAG3, against GITR, OX40, and 41BB. And so, again, there's right now we're focusing just on a small amount, but there's a lot of ongoing research in this area. So, again, to look at these T cell immune checkpoint inhibitors, which from now on I'll um, identify as ICI in many of my slides, we have antibodies against PD1. And as you can see here on this picture, so a PD-1 generally is present on your T cell or your immune cell, whereas your PD-L1 is present on your tumor cell. And so this is one of the mechanisms that the tumor cells deploy. They put up these PD-L1s, they bind to PD-1 on your T cells, and it makes it so that the T cells get fatigued, they get tired, they kind of ignore the tumor cell. But when we use these antibodies that go and break that bond between PD-1 and PD-L1, as it's shown here in the bottom right, you can actually see that the T cells are now able to re-engage and able to kill the, the cancer cells. And so, as I mentioned again, pembrolizumab or Keytruda and then atezolizumab or Tecentric are the two that are here in pink and that are approved for breast cancer currently. Now there's, as, as I mentioned, multiple agents that are currently approved. Um, this is, uh, every time I do a, a talk like this, this slide becomes more complicated. Um, because of the fact that we've had so many approvals in recent years, you can tell our friends at the FDA have been very busy, um, as if many researchers in immunotherapy. And as you can see here, that there's multiple indications in multiple tumor types. Many of these indications are in the advanced and metastatic setting. However, the ones that are, have been denoted with an asterisk are ones that actually also have indications in earlier settings. So like in breast cancer, which I'll talk about, there was a recent neoadjuvant or prior to surgery approval for pembrolizumab. Many of these um, approvals for immune checkpoint inhibitors are as monotherapy or in combination with other agents. Um, but as you can see again here for triple negative, we have both the pembrolizumab and then the atezolizumab that have been approved. Now, why exactly is there all this interest about immunotherapy? You know, I've told you a little bit about what these are, and this is something called a spider plot. I like these plots as a, uh, as a medical oncologist and as a researcher because I think they tell us a lot about how patients do on these agents. So to orient you to this spider plot, each line is a patient who has received a tezolizumab. These patients are all bladder patients. This was one of the earlier trials um, that looked at immunotherapy in bladder. And you can see here, the authors really did a nice job with showing, you know, if the line goes up, that means the cancer grew on therapy. And you can see using the time on study um, on the X or the Y axis or the X axis here, that this is in days. So patients who had read, they had rapid progression, um, in many cases, patients that the lines that are blue, it's stable disease. The lines that are green or black are patients who had a reduction in their tumor size. And what's exciting, um, what's exciting about these is that in some patients that have a shrinkage in their tumor, that some of these long or some of these responses can actually be long lasting. And so it's exciting because patients who have metastatic cancer, even if you know there's still cancer left, if the tumor is stable, if it's shrunk, if it's not causing any problems, the question becomes now, can we potentially change cancer into more of a chronic condition like diabetes or high blood pressure? We, you know, we may never actually cure patients of these. And, and obviously that's always the goal is to cure. But again, if, if patients have cancer that's not growing, that's not causing any problems, patients can live for a very long time and potentially without any additional treatment. Now, when we look at I mean, the estimated deaths from cancer in the US in 2021, 
you can see that the, many of those approvals for the indications are for many of the top causes of cancer-related deaths in the U.S. Um, however, not all of them. And I think, though, when we talk about these immune checkpoint inhibitors and the potential impact that they have on patients, there's this one kind of area that I like to highlight and I think is very um, it's very important and, and very impressive when we look at the data here. So as I've mentioned, that among patients who've received immune checkpoint inhibitors, when we compare it to chemotherapy, that when patients respond, we can see in some patients very longer periods of disease control, and in some cases, better overall survival, which again, anytime in cancer care, the longer patients survive, that's really the ultimate goal. And I think one case to really highlight with this is to look at kind of the case of ipilimumab. So ipilimumab or Yervoy was the first uh, immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitor that was approved. It was back in um, 2011, and it was approved for metastatic melanoma. Now this was exciting because this was the first drug of any kind to ever show to extend survival in metastatic melanoma, one of our really hard to treat cancers. And while that was exciting, the more exciting point came actually just a year or so ago when we looked at our cancer statistics for 2020, where we saw that you know, there was an overall decrease in the cancer death rate um, from 1991 to 2017 by about 30%, which again is, is quite impressive. And when they look specifically at 2016 and 2017, it was a 2.2% decline in the cancer death rate. And this was the single year large drop um, that was reported, that has ever been reported. And when they looked at this into detail, they found that really it was the progress in the treatment of melanoma with this one category of drugs, immunotherapy, that drove the most rapid death rate decline. And in, during the period of between two 2013 and 2017, the overall melanoma death rate dropped by 7% per year which is incredible for a cancer that really generally had a very low survival rate. And as you can see in 2020 or in 2010, the one year survival rate for patients with metastatic melanoma was 42%. And by the time we got to 2015, it was 55%. And so again, I think that this kind of, um, this case studies here about the melanoma and ipilimumab really demonstrates how impactful one category of drugs really can have. Um, on cancer survival. Now to go back to that initial um, spider plot that we had talked about with the tezolizumab and bladder cancer, I think it's also important to point out that while we did have a lot of good patients' responses, that not every tumor type responds. And even in the approved indications, most patients still don't respond. So this benefits a small number of patients. And so many of us researchers ask, well, what do we do about these patients who don't respond? And how can we improve responses so that immunotherapy is, is, can be extended to more patients? And with that, I'll kind of move into now some of the success stories in breast cancer, because that is definitely one of the questions that we ask is in breast cancer with these immunotherapy approvals that I'm gonna talk about, it still only benefits a small number of patients. And while obviously that's good, we need to do better. We need to extend the benefit to other patients. So let's start with just a brief history of immunotherapy and breast cancer. So this actually dates back to 1974. And I think that this is one of the really kind of pivotal observation studies that I have found extremely impactful in my research um, and others have as well. A surgeon named Dr. DePaulo noticed that in his patients, when he found tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or these white cells that were in or around breast cancer, that these patients who had the white cells that had the immune response in their cancer did much better than those patients who had no immune cells. And this was even in patients who had very poorly differentiated, very aggressive appearing breast cancers. If they had immune cells there, they did better in some cases than patients who had well differentiated tumors, but no immune cells. Now, this was not lost in the immunotherapy um, community. And so back in the 1980s and 90s, um, we actually evaluated the potential for bone marrow transplants for breast cancer patients. Um, in about a 15 year span or so, there were about 30,000 women who received autologous bone marrow transplants, meaning that we took cells from them, 
um, we gave patients ultra high doses of chemo and then gave the cancer cells back in the hopes that we could eradicate breast cancer. Unfortunately, despite some very promising early studies, the final study showed that there was no um, improvement in survival with these patients who had bone marrow transplants. And actually patients had many more side effects and, and issues related to this treatment. So that, that's not obviously standardly done at this point. However, you know, immunotherapy obviously pressed on in breast cancer. And so in 1998, we had the FDA approved trastuzumab or Herceptin for HER2 positive breast cancer. And this was really kind of the first approved immunotherapy agent, or at least I like to think of that in breast cancer. This is a monoclonal antibody um, many patients have received at this point. And again, it's one of those agents that dramatically changed how well women did with breast cancer. Now, 2011, I've already mentioned that was the year that ipilimumab was approved and really kind of many people will consider that this is the age of immunotherapy started at that point. Now, since then, there again have been multiple approvals for various agents. In 2017, pembrolizumab was approved for MSI high or DNA uh, damage um, repair deficient tumors. Um, this is a small percentage of breast cancer patients, about 1.5%, but, but this was kind of our first indication where we could use immunotherapy in breast cancer patients. In 2019, we had the first breast cancer specific approval, and that was with the combination of atezolizumab and nabpaclopaxel for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. In 2000, uh, or 2020, we had the FDA approval for pembrolizumab with TMB high tumors, which is again, another small percentage of breast cancer patients, uh, less than 5%. But again, this is another potential indication where it can be used. In 2020, um, we had second breast cancer specific approval for pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy and metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And then just a couple of weeks ago, very exciting, we had the first approval for pembrolizumab plus chemo in the neoadjuvant or early breast cancer setting. And I'll go through some of the data for all of these um, studies in the next few slides. So again, looking at these FDA approved indications in breast cancer, we have three breast cancer specific and two breast cancer non or non breast cancer specific. The majority of these, so four out of the five are accelerated approval, which means that based upon ongoing studies, these approvals are still somewhat in limbo. However, pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy was just um, a couple weeks ago granted regular approval. Um, and so that's an approval that will stay, um, at, you know, definitely for patients who have metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Now, if you've noticed, most of the breast cancer specific um, uh, approvals are with combinations. And so often patients will say, well, but, you know, really, I'm hoping to be able to get rid of chemo. Why is it we need to use this in combination with chemo? And so we've looked at immune checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy or just these agents by themselves in breast cancer. Um, and unfortunately, because breast cancer is a cold tumor, again, these immunotherapy agents by themselves generally tend to not work as well. As you can see here, this was one of the early trials with atezolizumab. That's again, one of the approved agents currently in breast cancer. And as you can see that some patients did have responses to atezolizumab just on its own but a lot of patients actually had rapid growth of their cancer. And so it showed that the tezolizumab for many patients alone was not enough. When we can find a tezolizumab with nabpaclitaxel, you can see here again on this spider plot that we now had many, many more patients who had a reduction in their cancer. And we saw much better control with patients when we had this combination than we did with the tezolizumab by itself. We've done multiple trials at this point that have looked at these various immune checkpoint inhibitors by themselves, and it's all been similar. We have a couple patients who respond, but overall patients, um, breast cancer patients, had very little responses to the agents by themselves. They really needed combinations. And so when we think of atezolizumab um, with the approval with metastatic triple negative breast cancer, it was based upon this trial called the Impassion 130. These are patients who are first line metastatic triple negative breast cancer patients that are PDL1 positive, um, the tumors are. They look at about 900 patients. And again, as I said, this was an accelerated approval. So, you know, when we look at the bottom line of this trial, when we combine nabpaclitaxel or abraxane plus atezolizumab compared to nabpaclitaxel alone, was cancer better controlled? And the investigators looked at something called progression-free survival 
And yes, we saw that it was. It was about a two and a half month improvement in survival in patients who were PDL1 positive. And do patients live longer? And so the study statistically, um, the answer to this question was no, they did not live longer. And it was based really upon the way the study was designed. The study did not have enough power or wasn't designed in such a way that they could look at overall survival in that PDL1 positive group. However, many clinicians and investigators will say, but we improved patient survival from 18 months with NAB paclitaxel alone to 25 months when we added atezolizumab to NAB paclitaxel. And while this may not be statistically significant for the study, many people say that this is an impressive clinical improvement. And I would agree to give seven more months of survival, especially if patients are doing well. And so um, you know, this is, again, one of the accelerated approval agents. We did find that, you know, obviously there are side effects with these immunotherapy agents, but we found that when we added the chemo to the immunotherapy in this trial, that the side effects were not necessarily any worse with the combination than either of the agents by themselves. So the side effects were not worse. For the second approval, this was pembrolizumab in metastatic triple negative breast cancer. This was based upon the Keynote 355 study. This again also was first line or untreated patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer that were PDL1 positive. This was also about 850 patients. As I mentioned, this had received accelerated approval in 2020 and just a couple of weeks ago received regular approval. And so again, kind of the bottom line of this study is when we combined chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab, and that was compared to chemotherapy alone, did we see better cancer control? And so yes, we saw improved progression-free survival of 9.7 months in patients who got the, the pembrolizumab plus chemo compared to 5.6 months with patients who had chemotherapy alone. And again, the ultimate question is, well, did patients live longer? And so did they have an improved overall survival? And just uh, last week, it was released, it was a news release that we met this, um, this, uh, this goal that there, yes, there is an improved overall survival. However, the exact data has yet to be released. But this was the improvement in survival was the reason that it was approved um, by the FDA for regular approval. And again, when we looked at side effects, we found that the combination of the chemo plus the pembrolizumab, while yes, there were side effects that are um, with each individual agents, the combination did not in increase the number of significant or high grade side effects. Now in patients who have pembrolizumab in MSI high breast cancer, so again, micro, MSI high is microsatellite instability, um, high or DNA um, mismatch repair solid tumors. These are common in things like endometrial cancer, or uterine cancer, or colon cancer. We can see these high numbers of, of these types of tumors. Um, based upon multiple studies being combined, the FDA approved the use of pembrolizumab in MSI high tumors. Um, and back in 2017, it was an accelerated approval. And this was the first approval by the FDA that wasn't tumor specific. So it actually was really exciting in immunotherapy because again, it showed that these immunotherapy agents can cross tumor types. Now, overall, there was only about 150 patients on trial and only two had breast cancer. So this is rare in breast cancer, but again, kind of when we looked at the bottom line, is when they actually used just pembrolizumab by itself, we saw a response rate of about 40%. So again, in these patients that have these MSI high tumors, pembrolizumab by itself um, is potentially an option. There are very limited studies looking at this specifically in breast cancer at this point. Um, however, you know, it's, it's obviously always something that I'll talk with my patients about if they truly do have an MSI high tumor. Now, pembrolizumab in tumor mutational burden, high tumors. So basically, again, patients, this was a um, keynote study looking at pembrolizumab in previously treated patients, and this was all solid tumor. So this was not breast cancer specific. And they looked at the number of mutations per megabase, and they defined high as 10 mutations or higher. To give you a sense, most breast cancers have one to two mutations per megabase. So this is much higher than what we generally see in breast cancer, but about 5% of all breast cancer will have this MSI high status. Interestingly, we obviously tend to see it more commonly in metastatic breast cancers compared to primary breast cancers, 
but we also tend to see it more commonly in lobular breast cancers compared to ductal breast cancers. So many of you, your doctors have may talk to you about that if you have invasive ductal versus invasive lobular breast cancer, that's one of the reasons that this is important because we do see some differences in things like mutational burden with those different subtypes. Now in this specific trial, we had about 800 patients on the efficacy cohort. A small number of these were breast cancer patients, but the FDA did grant pembrolizumab and TMB high tumors accelerated approval in 2020. And again, when we looked at single agent pembrolizumab in these patients that had a, a high mutational burden, cancer was better controlled. We had response rates of about 30% in those that had an, a high tumor mutational burden versus but low. And it, when we look at, did patients live longer so that they have an overall survival? I say no, but. So when you looked at the overall numbers, it really didn't matter whether you were TMB high or low, the survival was about the same. But in some patients who did have responses, again, we saw those very prolonged or durable responses for many years. And what's interesting is when they actually looked at this by specific tumor types, so for colon cancer example, when we see these TMB high tumors, that this can make a significant impact on survival. So maybe as a whole for solid tumors, the TMB status does not um, indicate uh, improved survival with pembrolizumab, but it likely is tumor specific. And so because in that initial study, there were not a lot of patients with breast cancer that had a high mutational burden, there was a subsequent study called the TAPER study. It was small, only about 30 patients with metastatic breast cancer, but it was mixed between different receptor statuses. So we had about half that were triple negative and half that were hormone receptor positive. And in this study, they actually found a response rate of about 37%, which is actually a little bit better than what we saw in that initial study with a response rate of 30% in all tumor types. So again, in patients who have breast cancer that have a high mutational burden, single agent pembrolizumab may be an option for them as well. And it seems again, that while we, most of the indications that I've talked about so far have been in triple negative breast cancer, this may be one of the indications where patients who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer could benefit from immunotherapy by itself. And so this was the most recent approval. This was pembrolizumab in early breast cancer um, that was triple negative. These were patients who were untreated and these are patients who are receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This was about a little bit over 1,100 patients. Um, and this was just granted FDA accelerated approval just a couple of weeks ago. And so again, kind of the bottom line of the study. So when we use chemotherapy, which is kind of our standard dose dense, adriamycin, cytoxan, plus paclitaxel and carboplatin, plus pembrolizumab compared to just the chemotherapy alone, do we see better cancer control? And the answer was yes. Patients had improved pathologic complete responses. So in about 65% versus 51%. Again, in breast cancer, we often will use pathologic complete response as an indicator of how patients are gonna do. We know that in triple negative breast cancer, that if a patient gets chemotherapy first and then goes to surgery, that those patients who have no cancer or very little cancer left at the time of surgery do much better from a long-term perspective than patients who have a lot of cancer left. <coughs> so we know that, um, or we often use pathologic complete response as a surrogate for long-term outcomes. And so when we look at the long-term outcome, what was just resulted a couple of weeks ago was specifically the event-free survival rate at three years. And this was the thing the FDA had been waiting on in order to uh, approve this in the early triple negative breast cancer setting. And so this study did show that patients had lower rates of cancer recurrence at three years in those patients who received pembrolizumab. And this, again, it was 80, almost 85% versus 75%. And what was interesting about this is this was regardless of pdl one status in patients with triple negative breast cancer. As I mentioned before, many of those approvals in metastatic breast cancer are, require that the, the tumor is pdl one positive. However, in this study, they found whether patients were pdl one positive or negative, they benefited from the addition of pembrolizumab. Obviously, though, with patients who were PD, had pdl one positive tumors, that they did better. Now, when we look again where the side effects worse, and this is especially important in patients who have early breast cancer, 
the general thought was no, they, the side effects weren't really any worse when we added the combination of pembrolizumab to this chemotherapy regimen that we commonly use. The side effects were relatively what we expected for either the chemotherapy by itself or the pembrolizumab by itself. Of course, obviously, anytime we add immunotherapy, it's another potential set of side effects that patients can develop. And in the early setting, we worry about that because some of these side effects from immunotherapy can be long lasting. Um, and so in patients that hopefully have a very long time to live, we wanna make sure that even if it's a lower grade side effect, that it's a manageable side effect. And so these are some of the things that, uh, you know, aside from specific to breast cancer, there's a lot of research going in to how do we either decrease the side effects from immunotherapy or how do we better manage them? And so to come, come back to the different types of immunotherapy, so we've talked about T-cell checkpoint modulation. I'm not really gonna touch upon therapeutic cancer vaccines, although there's currently three that are approved. Um, I've worked on many of these in the research setting during my time at the NCI. Um, and these are exciting agents, although none of them are approved in breast cancer currently. I am gonna talk briefly about CAR T cells because that's one of the areas I think that is sensationalized a little bit with immunotherapy and breast cancer. There are currently five approved agents um, that are CAR Ts that none of them are in breast cancer, which is why none of them are bolded. But a CAR T cell, so what exactly is that? So it's a chimeric antigen receptor. In, in 2018, it was named as the advance of the year. These CAR T cells, blood or T cells are taken out of a patient. They're then modified in the lab. We grow them up. And basically when we modify them, I think of them, you know, we're kind of almost training them like they train the Marines. You know, we make these super killers. We make these Marines, um, these T cells, be able to hunt out these tumor cells and get rid of them. And then we infuse them back into the patients. And then these super T cells can basically go and kill the cancer cells. And they're kind of impervious to all of these different defenses that the tumor cells can put up. Now in breast cancer, there's a lot of ongoing research in this area. We have various targets for our T cells, or our CAR T cells. All of these um, uh, types of agents require a specific target that's present on breast cancers. And as you can see, there's different targets, but there's also varying expressions. This is specifically looking at those in triple negative. Um, and one sometimes what tumors do to get smart is if they know that the T cells are reacting to this, they can downregulate or decrease the amount of the expression of these proteins on the surface of the tumor. Um, but these, again, this is an exciting area of immunotherapy and breast cancer. None of these are FDA approved at this point in breast cancer, but um, hopefully in years to come, we'll have some CAR T cells for breast. Now, the final area that I'm going to talk about is effector antibodies and antibody drug conjugates. And so, you know, the ones, again, that are bolded are ones that are approved for use in breast cancer. Perceptin, we don't really need to talk about. That's been around for a long time, as well as Cadsyla. However, I do want to briefly talk about Trodelvi and, and HER2. So, Sacatuzumab, um, also known as um, Tridelvi. This is approved in metastatic triple negative breast cancer. This is based upon the ASCENT trial. And these are patients that were heavily pretreated with metastatic triple negative breast cancer, about 460 or so patients. It recently received regular approval in 2021 by the FDA. And so again, when we look at the um, Bottom line of this study, we saw that cancer was better controlled with Tridelvi compared to chemotherapy. So we saw a progression-free survival of 5.6 months versus 1.6 months. But more importantly, patients lived longer when they received this. And so almost doubled the survival in these patients. And again, you know, when we looked at side effects, every agent always had side effects, but the side effects for the most part were not necessarily any worse than many of these chemotherapies that we've already been giving. Um, you know, again, patients walked and say, well, but we want, you know, a better acting drug, but less side effects. And again, that's one of those areas that we're still working on, but many patients tolerated this Tridelvi agent quite well. Now, trastuzumab droxacan, also known as HER2, is another antibody drug conjugate, and this is for use in HER2 positive breast cancer that's metastatic. This was based upon the DESTINY trial, and this has accelerated approval. What I'm showing you here is something called a waterfall plot. And so this is another way kind of, of looking at responses with the tumors. As you can see, the zero line here, that's where everybody starts from baseline. Any lines that go up, the cancer grew. 
and any lines that go down mean the cancer shrunk. And so this is a quite impressive waterfall plot for this agent, which is why it received accelerated approval with just a small phase two trial. Um, it's because we saw a response rate in patients who were heavily pretreated. I think the number of the average number of treatments was six per patient previously to receiving this agent. <clears throat> and despite that, we saw a response rate of about 60%. And so again, when we look at the bottom line of the study, cancer was better controlled. And it does seem that patients live longer. You know, the, the median overall survival in this patient population had not yet been reached when patients, when this was um, uh, reported. But at 12 months, 86% of patients were still alive. And again, in these patients who've received pro six prior therapies who have metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer, that's really impressive. Now with this, side effects were not necessarily worse than standard chemotherapy. However, we did discover that one of the side effects that we see with this is something called interstitial lung disease. And so patients can develop cough and shortness of breath. Um, and sometimes it can actually um, lead to a patient's death. So this is one of those serious side effects that we unfortunately found with this new agent. Luckily, it's very rare. Um, but again, if you're one of those patients who developed this, um, this could obviously be a, a very bad side effect for patients. And so there's been a lot of um, educational um, efforts from the drug company, as well as in various educational institutions about making sure that doctors like myself know that this is a side effect and then letting us know how to treat this early before it gets to a point where it's so bad that we can't reverse it. So I've told, talked to you about various approvals that we've had with immunotherapy checkpoints and antibody drug conjugates, talked to you a little bit about some CAR T cells. And so now where do we go from here? And I think this is the part that I find very exciting that I think really the only answer is onward and upward. And so, you know, when we've talked about these novel agents, I've listed kind of four categories at this point, but really there's a lot more categories of many more types of agents that are being developed. This figure here was from a study that was done back in 2018, so it's actually a little dated at this point, but I like it because if you look at it, everything in gray here, these are the agents that are currently in the preclinical and discovery. And you can see there's a lot of things that back in 2018 that were in those early phases that many of them have maybe moved now to the clinical part. And so this is a field that is constantly changing, that is very exciting to be in. There's all sorts of incredible drugs. We're learning more about these agents and what they do. And specifically how these agents work in combinations with other immunotherapy agents. You can see there was a tremendous growth of using uh, combinations with immune checkpoint inhibitors like PD-1 and PD-L1 just from 2010 to 2017. And these clinical trials, they combine it sometimes with other immunotherapy, sometimes it's with chemotherapy, sometimes it's with radiation, sometimes it's with other novel agents. And the reason, you know, that when we look at these things, which this is, these are called bubble charts, where the, like the larger bubble means that there's more clinical trials with that category. So you can see the larger bubble, there's more research that's going on in that space. But the reason that I think that these combinations are so important is because when I think of the tumor microenvironment and the fact that it's dynamic, that it can change in response to the treatments that we give as oncologists, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation or immunotherapy, I think of it much like making a pasta sauce. You know, if you just throw a whole bunch of things in there, it may not necessarily be a good tasting sauce, but you know, sometimes if you start with some oil and you ground the garlic and maybe add some onions in, you know, sometimes you get a little bit more of a robust flavor. And I think that's the point where we're really at in terms of immunotherapy as a field, but also in breast cancer. In some of these colder tumors, how is it, what agents do we need to add and in which order do we need to add them to get the optimal environment to allow the immune system to do its thing? And so, Things that are various places, various institutions are investing in that specific question. Um, at Ohio State, we recently were entering our third year now at the Pelotonia Institute for Immuno-Oncology, of which I'm a member. Um, and this is a really, you know, these institutions are really exciting because it really is bench to bedside. 
So my primary role, I'm a translational immuno-oncologist. I kind of work between the scientists at the lab and then help bring some of their work into the clinic. And it's exciting when we have a, an institute like this and this is not unique to Ohio State, many um, large institutions are doing this, but the interaction between the doctors and the um, preclinical scientists are really important because of that dynamic nature of the tumor microenvironment. And so kind of giving constant feedback to each other about what they're seeing in the lab and what we're seeing in the clinic. And that's really how many of these advances have happened in the last decade in immunotherapy that it hasn't been just in a silo where patients in the clinic stay in the clinic and patients that are, or um, you know, might stay in the lab, that it really is kind of an open exchange. And for those of you who have been involved in research studies, I can't thank you enough because it's patients like you that are selfless, that are able, that are, are wanting to contribute to the greater good of, of helping others and helping science, that that's what makes these advances possible. So with that, um, I'm just going to summarize. So we've talked about the past. We know the immune system is the first line of defense against cancer. We've talked about the present. We've talked about these success stories with immunotherapy and breast cancer. And we've talked about where do we go from here? So trying to identify maybe optimizing the combinations and the sequencing of the agents. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge to life again for inviting me here, um, acknowledge the clinical trial patients and their families. I know that in being involved in a clinical trial for many patients is a hardship. It's more time at the clinic. It's more time away from your families. It's more blood draws. It's more biopsies. But without your involvement in research, we can't make some of these advances. And I, as one of my mentors always used to say, the clinical trials that we do today direct tomorrow's treatments. And so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to thank my mentor at the Pelotonian Institute for Immuno-Oncology, Dr. Z. Hai Lee. Um, my incredible mentors at Division of Medical Oncology, Dr. Vershag and Hayes and Dr. Vasu, um, my mentor in breast oncology at Ohio State, Dr. Ramaswamy, and then my mentors and sponsors from my time at the NCA, NCI and, and earlier times. Um, much of what we do in, in oncology and immunotherapy is really kind of based upon the shoulders of giants. And I've been lucky to be able to have incredible mentors and sponsors um, throughout my career. And so with that, I will open it up to any questions or comments. And thank you so much for your time. Hi, Dr. Gotti Mays. It's, it's Eileen and, and, and uh, greetings to everyone who is, uh, is with us at this point. I have been monitoring the questions as we go along. And in fact, many of the questions that came in, particularly the earlier ones, you really addressed and you addressed nicely through the program. There are a couple of uh, disease state questions that I'm gonna throw out to you. And I think you may have addressed them, but let's just kind of emphasize them. Which agents are relevant for estrogen, progesterone, uh, progesterone positive cancers? Sure, so right now, I, I think really the only potential indication for immunotherapy in tumors that are hormone receptor positive mm -hmm. is really the pembrolizumab in patients that have TMB high tumors. Um, you know, as I mentioned in that TAPOR study, um, it did find that patients who had TMB high tumors, so having a lot of mutations, that they responded to pembrolizumab by itself. And in their TAPOR population, about 50% or so were, had hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So at this point, I think that's really the only approved indication. There have been multiple studies that have looked at combinations of like CDK4-6 inhibitors, so like palbocyclib, abamacyclib, with these um, uh, with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and these have been promising, but nothing at this point is approved in hormone receptor positive um, specifically. And again, the only specific indication at this point that's approved by the FDA would be for those that have high mutation uh, in their tumors. Thank you. All right. So uh, then the next question comes out is, uh, do immunotherapy options excuse me, exist for triple negative breast cancer metastatic patients in the adjuvant mode? And I think you might have addressed this. Yeah, so um, in patients who have a triple negative breast cancer, so in the adjuvant setting, meaning after surgery, um, the, there's no approval specifically for that, but the approval for the neoadjuvant chemo with the pembrolizumab 
the pembrolizumab is actually um, extended for the adjuvant setting for I think nine to 12 months. So we will continue in those patients where we start pembrolizumab in the neoadjuvant setting into the adjuvant setting. Um, and there's a lot of discussion given this recent approval in terms of patients who may have been able to receive pembrolizumab in the neoadjuvant setting. Would we do it in the adjuvant setting? And we just don't have the data at this point. Um, there have been multiple studies that have looked at combinations of like nivolumab um, plus uh, capecitabine, which is obviously one of the agents we commonly use in the adjuvant setting. Those studies are still early at this point. Um, nothing is approved by the FDA, but there's definitely a lot of trials right now that are going on in that adjuvant setting. Thank you. Um, we're gonna just shift a, a little bit from our thought process to, to talk about, and, and you mentioned side effects. And so there naturally is a concern about side effects. Uh, one of the questions that came in, you know, uh, you know, from a quality of life standpoint, how does immunotherapy uh, compare with some of the chemotherapy drugs and their yeah. concerns there? So that, that's a great question. And there actually have been a couple of um, recently reported uh, quality of life studies based upon some of these larger phase three studies. So the Impassion 130 trial, which was the one where it was atezolizumab with nabpaclitaxel, um, they just, uh, maybe within the last year or so released a study that looked at quality of life and patient related outcomes. And in that study, they found that patients who received the combination that they did not have any worse, um, uh, quality of life, that all of the patient reported outcomes were about equivalent between the two. Um, you know, I think just like with chemotherapy, not everybody who receives immunotherapy has side effects. And so it's still a small percentage of patients. Um, having treated patients with immunotherapy agents now for five plus years, I think that the thing that is unique about immunotherapy with some of the side effects is, you know, with chemotherapy, a lot of times the side effects are during the, the chemo. And so you stop the chemo and many of the side effects, not all, will improve. Um, with immunotherapy, some of them can be a little bit longer lasting. So they may not be as high grade, but if somebody has a low grade fatigue every day, that can be bothersome. And so, you know, and that's always been one of our concerns, but it was definitely reassuring when we looked at the patient related outcomes for Impassion 130, that again, it didn't seem from the patient's perspective that it was much different. Of course, every you know patient and every side effect's a little different. Um, I'm always sure to make sure that I talk with my patients about the potential for some of these side effects. But again, just like chemo, not everybody always gets the side effects. And if they do, many times they're manageable or there's ways that we can find to help manage them for the patient. Good answer, thank you. Uh, is there a benefit for those who now have no evidence of disease? Uh, and I'm assuming that that would be a person who is a cancer survivor. And could this be potentially a prophylactic treatment? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and that's one of the things that many of us are very interested in. Um, because we know that the immune system does a much better job of eradicating tumor cells when the tumor's small. Um, so there have definitely, there have been trials that um, are ongoing trials that I've referred patients to um, where we've been using things like vaccines to see maybe specifically in the HER2 setting. So um, there are multiple trials right now in patients who had HER2 breast cancer in the early setting, have no evidence of cancer at this point, but are higher risk of recurrence and we're more concerned about. And so there's different vaccines now that are specifically against HER2 that they're evaluating in trials to see if we can answer that question of, can we potentially use some of our immunotherapy agents so that if a tumor cell starts popping its head back up, perhaps can we get rid of it? So there's nothing approved currently, but there's a lot of interest in research and there's trials. Um, I've seen trials both in HER2 and in triple negative, um, specifically trying to address that question. You know, it will stay with me for a long time, your, what you call your bubble chart, which talks about the trials and there's, you know, big levels for perhaps high a number of trials that are going on for certain uh, agents and whatnot. So that will hit me 
Um, the, there was a follow-up question about vaccines that I'm just going to read to you exactly because I don't exactly know where she's going. Is there any benefit to patients? Oh, I'm sorry. Will there be vaccine? Will there be any vaccines currently under clinical trials being fast tracked for FDA approval? Sure. So um, probably. So these therapeutic cancer vaccines. Um, Right now, there is nothing that's being fast tracked. Um, you know, I've worked on uh, three or four vaccines at this point, um, and these have all been in the early setting where we've done phase one studies, making sure that they're safe. Some of them have been phase two, and I think these vaccines, I think, are important, especially in the advanced cancer setting. I think these vaccines are important components of immunotherapy combinations. Um, but I don't think that they would necessarily be enough to be on their own. In the setting we were just talking about where those patients don't have um, any evidence of cancer, again, those studies are ongoing. There's nothing that, that I know of, at least at this point, that's being fast-tracked. But again, I think a lot of us in immunotherapy would love if there's a vaccine that we can give for patients who we are concerned about a higher risk um, where again, potentially we could use the vaccine and, and hopefully help stimulate the immune system, just like a vaccine does against the flu or against, the, against COVID. So um, a question, I'm gonna jump back to another question, but uh, I'm gonna ask, is there a thought of a vaccine against reoccurrence? Right, so that's, that's kind of that same setting. So okay. um, what the, the hope is, with some of these vaccines. And again, these trials are ongoing. There's unfortunately the trials that have been done so far have not necessarily shown that it, it does impact that. Um, but the hope would be that for some of these trials that if these vaccines can retrain the immune system to recognize the cancer cells that if they pop their heads up in that you know, early recurrence setting that you know, the immune system could kill them off, so. Is there any benefit to patients who have both triple negative and triple positive metastatic tumors? So, I, you know, I think it, it's always a discussion. I think that, that, you know, the honest answer is I don't, I'm not sure. I think it would, in my, if it was my patient, I probably would consider, well, when I, if I looked at these tumors, are the tumors that are causing the problems, are they the triple negative or are they the hormone receptor positive ones? Um, I generally try to, you know, in those patients who have these multiple types of tumors, sometimes we can't always have a unified approach where we can kind of go after everything adequately. So I try to think of, well, which one's causing the most problems? Um, but in, in a, a, you know, a tumor that's that has multiple components like that, it would make me wonder about the mutational status. It would make me wonder, you know, do we see some, what, what's the PDL1 staining? So is it a PDL1 positive tumor? And then, you know, have a discussion and with close observation. Um, you know, I, we have seen in hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients that some do benefit. So again, in, in tumor types that are kind of heterogeneous or multiple types, sometimes to me, I see that as more of an indicator that there may be more mutations. There may be things that perhaps we could, um, you know, really try to focus on with immunotherapy with that. So, um, you know, I would definitely consider it. I wouldn't say no, um, but I think there would be other factors to kind of discuss specifically with that case and, and obviously a discussion with the patient and, and the doctor. Okay, well, that actually gets through our questions at this point. Um, Dr. Gaddy Mays, this was a wealth of information. And I have to say, in all the talks we've done on breast cancer, you might be the first to talk about some immunotherapy and relate it to the, the analogy of a good pasta sauce. <laughs> because I think everyone loves a good pasta sauce. It's probably one of those more universal uh, mm -hmm. colors, if there ever was one. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that one. Of course. Um, but I want to mention a couple other things that are going on. And, uh, and, and, and you know, the work that you're doing at The Ohio State and the James Center and, uh, and, and the Immunotherapy um, Program, all that you're doing is just really great stuff. And so we applaud you. And I'm sure that I speak on behalf of the entire population uh, that's listening to this, to this talk today, that we wish you and all your fellow researchers well as you go forward and 
you know, may you have the wisdom to discern the findings and, and do the best, um, best you can in terms of this, the next discoveries. And I guess it's pretty exciting that, you know, a couple of things are, you know, kind of inching along the pipeline and uh, some things are coming. And so I think we're hearing that, you know, there may be some combination therapies and to, uh, and to not be afraid of that and to kind of embrace that we understand a little foundationally. One of the early questions that came in was, would this talk be appropriate for someone dealing with a prostate cancer um, a diagnosis? And, and actually I, I kind of responded to that already saying some of the foundation you laid uh, does apply across all of the immunotherapy uh, development that we're gonna see coming out. So with that, I'm going to uh, just wanna say thank you to everyone who's been with us today. And I wanna mention a couple of things uh, related to two life that are that are going on, and one is that we've had uh, a number of people that have uh, been sponsors of this program both in the past and in uh, and for this year, including the Christofoli brothers, the Seroptimists, which might be uh, one of our longer running sponsors, the Seroptimists International of Saratoga County. So we thank them for their uh, support. New York Oncology Hematology, St. Peter's Health Partners. And then I'm gonna add a point of clarification about our sponsor, Team Hinman. And so Team Hinman is, uh, is a group of colleagues of Mary Ginsburg who uh, did the introduction and welcome earlier in our program. And it was her colleagues who got together and wanted to provide some financial support for this day in particular. So we're very grateful to all of them. Um, you know, on behalf of the, uh, of the entire staff and the volunteer and the board network of, of Two Life and the, the, the guidance, we thank everyone for, uh, for their feedback. You are gonna see a survey come through and I would invite everyone to, to fill that out and to uh, provide some feedback on what, you, what topics you might find of interest, uh, particularly in the area of immunotherapy and other topics that'll come up in, in future programming we rely on that feedback and we wanna know what's of interest to you. And so this program certainly falls into that category of, uh, of coming full circle on our topics. Uh, other things, you know, here we are in August and enjoying all these warm, sunny days. And as we go into fall, uh, there will be a lot of activity happening. Look for, if you are getting our emails, uh, you'll be seeing information on the Pink Mile Challenge, which is, uh, the second year we're running a virtual 5K race. And then we will also have a fundraiser, Moonlight Soiree, which will be our, uh, our fall fundraiser. And other programs related to our Women's Health Conference program that will launch in November. And so you'll see more uh, announcements about that coming next month. And so with that, I'm going to say, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us today and for Dr. Gotti, Dr. Gotti Mays to, to speak, Mira, and, uh, and did the welcome. Melanie, thank you for putting this all together and uh, getting us to where we are today. Okay, everyone, have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us, and um, we'll see you next time. Bye.